Yes, now we'll open the meeting to questions and answers. I want to mention this question and answers because you can give, ask questions, you can give answers. You can give answers to my question or to your own questions. And you can ask a question on what I've just been saying in the last hour, or you can ask a question on what I've not been saying. <laughs> it's up to you. Yes. Ishar, um, thank you so much for coming. And uh, I was curious what questions you asked uh, Great Master Salman. Oh, I asked a lot of questions. I would spend the whole day telling you how many questions I asked. I was a great skeptic. As I was growing up, I was a skeptic. I thought that uh, uh, why I found a master was because of my dad. I said I, if I were born in a, another Christian family, I would be worshipping Christ. Born in a Hindu family, I'd be worshipping the Hindu deities. Born in a Muslim family, I'd be worshipping Allah. And de depending on the Christianity, which de denomination, Methodist, a Baptist or which one I would be born in. I just grow up believing that's the truth. And therefore, I have just been born in a family where my father followed somebody, therefore I followed. I can't follow that. It's, uh, it's, it's just blind. It's a blind faith. And I was not a believer in blind faith from very early age. I said, no, unless I can see something, I can't believe it. And I still tell people today, do not believe anything unless you see it. And that's what the great master taught me also. He said, true spirituality has no place for blind faith. True spirituality only goes step by step. Whatever you see and you believe, you take the next step after that. You do not have any scope for blind faith. Therefore, I was not willing to believe anything on blind faith. If I could see, yes, I would believe it. And that is why I asked a lot of questions. I, I asked him questions about uh, the truth, why, why he should think it's uh, good for one person or not another person. He answered that spirituality is not the privilege of any particular group. It's open to all humanity. He explained to me the uh, same thing that I'm sharing with you, that the truth is inside and it doesn't belong to religion. It belongs to the spirit of a human being. And any religion you can be. And he pointed out that amongst his disciples, there are people from almost every country of the world, a lot of them from the United States. And he had people who believed in different religions. He never asked anyone to change the religion. He says, stay and follow your religion. Try to understand what your religion is saying. And they found out the founders of all religions said the same thing. The truth is inside us. But when we, when we go to an outside ritual of a religion, we get deflected from true spirituality. Because religion teaches us uh, how to repair the building, how to uh, make more donations, how to, you know, pay for this thing or that thing, or that somebody else will pray for you. I can't believe that somebody else will pray for me better than I can pray. How, how come somebody says, you send me $25 and I'll pray for you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, then I find that we have converted a spiritual path into religious business. And that was a big, uh, big problem in my mind. And this uh, second problem was, of course, uh, this concept of the soul being separated from the creator and having to travel back through a spiritual journey in order to meet the creator and then merge in the creator. And the analogy given was that the soul is a drop of water and the creator is an ocean of water and that we'll one day go and merge in that ocean, never appealed to me at all. And I questioned the great master on that. And I said, I am a drop. Okay, I acknowledge I am a drop of water, but I am a drop of water. You want me to go and destroy myself by getting into this ocean? Where will I be? I'll be finished. At least as a drop, I have some identity. I was very particular about identity. I said, I have an identity and I lose it. What will the ocean gain by it? One drop will make no difference to it. Who will going to be winning? It's a lose-lose situation. And then he explained to me that you are indeed a drop that never left the ocean. That you have lost the awareness that you are the ocean. And spiritual path is not a journey. Spiritual path doesn't make you move anywhere. Spiritual path stays you where you are and you discover that you are always that. 
but you lost the awareness and you shrunk your awareness to the level of a drop. When you expand your awareness, you become the ocean. The spiritual journey is a journey through the expansion of awareness and not what was made out in the books that I was reading. Oh, you have a spiritual journey, then you go from one stage to another and then the whole concept of stages. Uh, I didn't like too much and I questioned him how these stages function that you are in one level now, now you'll go to another higher level, another heaven will come up, then a third heaven will come up, and we'll co go on rising like this, flying in the sky. I said, it doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, you can be able to fly from one place to another. I, I said, I could buy an aer aeroplane ticket. What's the big deal? To be able to fly somewhere doesn't make any sense to me, unless there is some purpose in it. So there are a lot of questions I was asking, and the answer that he gave, convinced me to a point but I was willing to go ahead and test out I have been to more master than anyone that I know I have converted to more religion than I know I've been baptized I've been to the synagogue I've been to the mosque I've been to all through that in the period of eight years of research eight years during my college days I went through all that and therefore today I can speak with some uh, kind of uh, experience behind me that I've seen all this. I've done the Hatha Yoga, the Kriya Yoga. I've done the Kudalini Yoga. I have lived on sand and water. And I've lived on all kinds of things. I've taken uh, plants that make you sexually impotent, that you can't do um, meditation unless you are um, not, not given up your lust and all that. I met all kinds of yogis. And great master answered all these questions that I was going through as I went through them. Eventually, in 1942, I asked him the last question about internal experiences. I didn't have to ask any question after 1942. That's a long time back, if you think of it. And people have asked me questions since then all over the world. And the answers were there which he had given me earlier. Well, how can I describe the beauty of this knowledge that he gave. The great master was indeed great. He answered everything. And he said, he initiated me. And he said, what I am sharing with you, I got from my master. It worked for me. I hope what I am giving you works for you. If it doesn't, give it up. He didn't bind me down to a cult that now you're trapped in this and you can't go anywhere. He said, it worked for me. You, If it works for you, good. If you find something better than what I've given you, take it. Don't, no need to come back to me to get my permission. If somebody gives you a better spiritual gift, a better way, take it. But do me one favor, he said, that when you get something better, come back and tell me so I'll also go and get it. The great master's words. I have been, I took him very literally. I've been searching till today. If today I find something better, I'll take it. And I'll go and report to him, you can take it too. That's the deal. So therefore, uh, he told me that this subject of spirituality is not based on blind faith. It's not based on somebody's statement saying God is sitting there, therefore you worship him. It's not based on that. It's based on personal realization within yourself. It's based on your own personal experience. It's based upon a wakefulness with certainty. It's not based upon conjecture or speculation at all. It's an actual experience that you have. When you have your own experience, nobody can deny it. It's your experience. People, inexperienced people keep on saying, supposing I have been to the Hawaii uh, beach uh, uh, in, in uh, Honolulu, and I've seen the beauty of that paradise there. And I come back and people who have read books about it keep on commenting upon it. What will I say to them? They are making mistakes. They are misunderstanding what it's like. They don't know. They've never been there. I will not be able to argue with them. I just smile. Sorry, they haven't been there. There's a big difference between seeing a place and reading about it. But somehow, religion has put us into a state where we read and we think we have got salvation. We have heard somebody give a 
sermon and we think we got salvation. Hearing and reading doesn't give us salvation. Acting upon what they're telling us gives us salvation. We don't do that. We think just reading, keep on reading more and more as if the books contain the whole thing. Well, the books do contain information. If I want to go to Hawaii and I read all the guidebooks on Hawaii, I've got all the information. I want to travel there by air and I buy a timetable or time schedule of airlines, I got all the information. But supposing I keep on reading the time schedule, will I reach there? I won't go anywhere, I'm just reading the book. But that's what we think religion has taught us, that you just keep on reading and you're getting something, you're getting somewhere. So great master gave a lot of answers to my satisfaction gradually. And it's a gradual process, I must say, because I realized, and I still realize today, that the human mind automatically creates doubt. Every part of us has a function to perform. The mind's function is to be a skeptic, to create a doubt. For the sake of advancing towards truth, it creates a doubt. But we forget that part, that the mind is creating skepticism and is creating a doubt so that we can overcome the doubt by knowledge and move forward. Not that we should be stuck in the doubt and not move forward. But that's what we do. The mind creates a doubt and we are afraid and we get stuck there. We don't move any forward. So lots of things van. Great master clarified. And then I began to understand that the mind is doing its own job. I have to do my own. So we do not, uh, we do not stop the mind from thinking. Mind never stops thinking. If the mind were to stop thinking, we'd be dead. The thinking of the mind is like the beating of the heart and the body. When the heart stops, the body dies. It has to be kept beating all the time. It beats all the time so that the body is alive. The mind thinks all the time for the mind to be alive. If the mind is not alive, the senses cannot be alive. The senses are not alive, the body cannot be alive. So the thinking of the mind is a function of the mind. And the more you think, the more doubts you have. Unfortunately, that's the truth. I did go into long seclusion for some time as an experiment because I wanted to make sure that this is a verifiable science. It's not, uh, it's not just a theory. It's a scientific thing that you can go within and have these experiences. So there was a period when I said, okay, it doesn't matter how long I have to meditate. I will do it for long periods. And I did it. But then I discovered something else. It's not merely the time that you spend in meditation. It's the intensity of the seeking with which you go into meditation. And secondly, it's the absence of distractions during meditation that help you. If you're distracted all the time, if you have a problem occurring which is bothering you, and you want to meditate and the problem keeps on bothering you, you can't meditate. It doesn't matter how long you meditate. Indeed, there is a story. There was a judge from Kapoorthala State, uh, Devan Lal, a disciple of Great Master. And he left his job after retirement and he came and he said, I'll be your doorman. He had been a judge. He had been a finance minister of his state. But he wanted to be a doorman for the Great Master. And he stood outside the door. And one day he said, Master, he told Maharaj Sawan Singh, he said, Master, I have been very happy to be your doorman, but I missed out on one thing. I missed out on meditation. And I should have, I should be able to catch up. This summer, you are not going to your holiday resort in Dalhousie, which is a hill station, and can you give me the keys of your house so I'll go and meditate three months straight and catch up with the lost time? Great Master said, oh, sure, sure, here are the keys. So he took the keys and went to the resort. The great master used to go every summer when it was very hot. And he went there. He said, now is the time for me to meditate three months at a stretch and catch up with the lost time. And as soon as he opened the house, some maintenance people came. Thank God you are here. We have to take care of the lumber. We have to take care of the plumbing. He said, okay, do it quickly, quickly. Then another man comes in. Then other satsangis came in. Oh, we are glad you are here. And he spent three months with less meditation than he was doing at the Dera. Thoroughly disappointed, he went back. 
to the great master. And he said, Master, I failed. He returned the keys and he said, Master, I failed. The master laughed. He says, how did you fail? He said, I thought I'll catch up on my meditation. There were so many distractions there. I couldn't even meditate what I normally do here. Great master said, you know, you didn't fail. You succeeded. So how did I succeed? You succeeded in find that effort is not the only way to go on this path. So he made another point that there are two things that uh, affect us, our progress on the path. Effort that we make and the grace that the master gives us. If without grace, we think without effort we can do everything, which is the mind's belief. The mind believes that our effort leads to everything. We are used to that. We are trained to do that. We are trained that you must make your effort to get any results. So he said he made the best effort and he failed. Great master said, this was a proof to you that effort is not the only thing on this path, that there is something else, that effort must be accompanied by grace of the master which is revealed to you by the love and devotion that you have during your meditation. Many people forget that true meditation, spiritual meditation, does not succeed unless you do meditation with love and devotion. The reason for that is very simple. That whereas thinking, reasoning, understanding belong to the mind and they are all parts of mental functions, love and devotion are not mental. They are spiritual. All love and devotion is spiritual. And therefore, if you be on the spiritual path without love and devotion, you are not really on the spiritual path. You are a mental game. So a lot of people think that the meditation is just a matter of putting your effort in a certain bodily position and using a mantra and keep on repeating, you get something. You get nothing by that. You can just keep on repeating. It's like a great master used to say, like trying to churn water to hope butter will come out of it. It doesn't. So we are doing an empty meditation if love and devotion is missing in it. The spiritual meditation requires love and devotion. And what is love and devotion? We don't know how to love. We know how to attach ourselves. Our attachments we call love. And we don't know how to love. Therefore, love is something that is pulled from the other side, that pulls us. When we are attracted to something, we are being pulled by love. When a human being comes and pulls us, attracts, then the love is flowing from that side. We, our being pulled is not that we are loving. If we try to love, it becomes a mental game. Therefore, when love pulls us and we respond to it, the response is called devotion. And that is why the term love and devotion is used together. Love and devotion. Love comes from the pull that we get and devotion is our response to it. Without love and devotion, there is no good meditation. In good meditation, you must have love and devotion. There was a disciple of great master in a city called Ludhiana in India. He had a factory uh, where they used to manufacture uh, you know, fabricated things or something. And he was initiated by great master. I used to visit that place sometimes. And one day, one of the local masters, there were several masters. There, one of the masters was visiting his house because even great master had visited his house one day. So out of that courtesy, that he's an old satsangi, that uh, master was visiting, I happened to be there, and the master showed a lot of courtesy to me, and then people following the master were asking me questions. So this man, whose name was Hira Singh, he asked me a question after they had left. He said, I want to ask you a question. You and I, have been initiated by the same master, great master. I have been following the rules of the game, two and a half hour meditation every day for 40 years. I have been a strict vegetarian, teetotaler, no alcohol, no drugs, led a very pious, holy life, and done 40 years of meditation and got nothing. How come uh, you seem to be uh, giving discourses and talking to people about experiences and so on. 
I said, first of all, let me clarify that I am like a parrot and I just speak what the master told me. So don't attribute anything to me. Secondly, you have asked a very fundamental question which you should have asked the great master. After all, he was alive for some years before you were in, after you were initiated. Why didn't you ask him? He said, I did ask him. I said, what did he say? He just smiled. <laughs> I said, then, <laughs> that wasn't a good enough answer. Then did you ask somebody else? I asked several masters. The same question. I said, if a master didn't give you an answer, what makes you think that I can give an answer to you? He said, I saw other people asking questions. You gave answers to them. So I am taking the courage to ask you this question. I said, you know, it's a very difficult question. I have to refer it to my master. When difficult questions come up in my life, I have no recourse but to go back to great master. So I'll put this to great master and get you an answer one day. He said, come, do it now. I said, I, I said no, it takes time. How much time? I said, it takes six months. I'll give you the answer in six months. I left. So after six months, I visited him again. And I said that the answer I got is very simple. That what you did for 40 years was your mind telling you, do put your effort like this and you'll get it. The element of love and devotion was missing. You did not see the picture of your master and ask for his grace and see the love flowing from him during your meditation. If you had done that, the result would have been different. Try it now, not, never too late. I visited him again after six months. He made more progress in six months than he made in 40 years. So that's why it's so important that this spiritual path is a path of love and devotion. Without love and devotion, it's hollow. It's a mental game then. It becomes just a mind game. So just keep this in mind. And love and devotion doesn't mean that you can do what you want. You have to be pulled by it. A person has just sent me an email yesterday. There's a guru I want to go and get initiated. Should I go? I said, sure. Go wherever a guru pulls you. Oh, that's the secret. If you are pulled by somebody, that's where you go. If there's no pull and you say you have to force yourself upon somebody and say you are my master, that doesn't work. The master pulls you. We, we deal with the problem of fear by going to the root of fear, which is the mind. The real fear goes away when we are not dependent on the mind, when we are able to ignore the mind. Through meditational practice, you can come to a stage where you totally ignore the mind. The mind thinks and you, you keep on thinking. I am going beside you on my own track. The mind says, do this, do this, don't do it. And you'll see that the mind ultimately, when it finds it doesn't have its own way, it begins to follow what you want it to do. And fear also disappears with it. A person who meditates and goes to this point where it transcends the mind or is able to ignore the mind is totally fearless. There's no fear in that person. And I've seen that. I saw a friend in you. I saw you are my friend. And I saw everyone. If you noticed, I saw each one who's sitting here. It was a beautiful view. It was wonderful. I saw the seekers sitting here. I saw the seekers who are ready. It was a very beautiful experience for me. And I recognized you. Good enough? Yes, he did. He did. He recognized another perfect living master in his lifetime. So have some other perfect living masters recognized other perfect living masters. The point I was making is that if we just look at a person and try to find out what his level of his realization is, we can't do it. Because we can only realize as far as we have ourselves realized. There are a large number of masters today in this world. In India particularly, there are a lot of masters. Great master used to say, even in his time, there were more masters than disciples in the country. <laughs> masters, mastership has become a big business too. <laughs> this religious teaching and spiritual teaching is becoming big business. 
whereas perfect living masters have never charged for their services ever. They have never claimed to be masters. They have never gone out performing public miracles to show to the people that they are masters. They never do that. They don't have to. Their job is very specific. The perfect living masters are here to pick up their marked souls. They know where they are. They will appear before those souls by coincidences, by circumstances. And those souls, step by step, gradually will recognize that they are the masters for whom they have been waiting. You may come across several masters in your life and a master will take you only as far as he is gone. He cannot take you more than that. But if your seeking is still there, you will still move on and meet a perfect living master. That means a perfect living master is bound to come into your life if your seeking is not satisfied. So that's why they respond to the seekers. There was a friend of mine, class fellow, and he took me to several masters. And I would tell him this master reached this level, this master is doing the yoga of the six chakras, this master has done the kundalini. He said, how do you know all that? I said, I have done it myself. So I know what they are talking about, what they are going through. What the great master taught and what helped me till today is something that I have not found anywhere else. If I find something better, I will switch, as I said. But not only have others not taught what he taught, they not even described what he taught, not even in physical description. So that's why it's a rare event. There are not too many perfect living masters. Masters galore. There was an engineer in Burma. His name was Tadlok Chand. And he was, we called him Engineer Saab because he was a civil engineer, roads engineer. He was a great seeker. And he was trying to find the yogis and swamis and gurus anywhere where he could find the truth. So he heard that in Madras, in India, in the city of Madras, there was a swami who could take you to higher levels of awareness. He was a very stingy person, this engineer. Uh, stingy, you understand stingy means that when he held a one rupee note in his hand, he would say, shall I spend it or not spend it? Spend it, not spend it, not spend it, back in your pocket. <laughs> By that process, even on a job as an engineer, he had accumulated 30,000 rupees in his bank account. And he packed up his belongings and went to Madras and went and met that Swami who said that he can take him to higher levels of consciousness and awareness. And he took him to be a perfect living master. And so he said, please, Swami, initiate me, give me this gift so I can reach the highest level of my true home. And the Swami said, have you heard the story of Ashtabakar and King Janak? I don't know how many of you have heard that story. When King Janak wanted enlightenment, Ashtabakar asked for three things. He said, give me your wealth, give me your body, and give me your mind, and I'll give you enlightenment. So he said, my requirement is the same. The Swami said, give me your wealth, give me your body, and give me your mind, I will give you enlightenment. Now, in spite of the fact this man was so careful about spending one rupee, he was willing to give anything that the Swami wanted. The Swami said, how much money do you have? Let's start with wealth first. <laughs> he said, I've got 30,000 bucks. He said, transfer those 30,000 bucks into my account. I want to build a temple. This man, look at the seeking he had. He transferred all his money into the Swami's account who started building his temple. He said, now give me your body. I said, what do I do? And the Swami said, to do the meditation that I teach, it is connected with breath work. And you have to breathe alternately from one, one nostril and the other nostril, alternately. Once from one side, once from the other. That's how my meditation will work. And in order to do that, you are not allowed to use your hands to close the doors one way like this, because then all the attention will go into the hands. It's an internal thing that you have to do. So the only internal thing how you can do it is to use your tongue. You have to put your tongue backwards. And from inside, switch from one side to the other. And he said to do that, the tongue must be cut from its tendons. 
so it can go out. So then the Swami opened his mouth and showed his tongue like a snake that came out. He says, see, I have got this surgery done and now I can twist my tongue back and I do the meditation. You have to undergo this. And because it's a body sacrifice, like you've given me your money, you're giving me your body, it'll be a painful experience. I will not just cut the tendons with a knife, I'll sandpaper it. And to make it more painful, I will not use sandpaper, I will use that nettle rash leaf, which is terrible, you know. I don't know if you uh, heard of that leaf, which has got stings on it, and stings so badly. And he says, I'll do it slowly every day. It'll take a month for your tongue to be separated, and then you can push it back and meditate. That man, the Lok Chand, underwent the whole torture. For one month he screamed, and he went through the torture, his tongue was separated. And then he learned how to meditate. And he was able to see some lights and some colors and so on. But he was not satisfied. He said, Master, I want something more. I want some real stuff. He said, my child, whatever I could give you, I've given you. You have to find somebody else for anything more. So he left. This man, the Lok Chand, eventually came to Great Master and was initiated and made great progress. We used to all admire him and and uh, respect him for his uh, progress. One day he was sitting with the great master in a small company in the evening we used to sit. I was there also. And he said to great master, Master, had I known that you are the perfect master that I have to come to, I would not have given those 30,000 bucks to that Swami there. <laughs> great master laughed and he said, the Lokchand, you don't know. The day you came to me, I transferred those 30,000 to my account. <laughs> <laughs> then great master explained that no step that you have taken in pursuance of your seeking ever goes waste. It doesn't matter what you have been doing. So long as you have been pursuing your seeking of the truth, you've gone through one step to another. All of it is accumulated when you find the perfect living master. And all of it counts. So you've not wasted any time. People ask me, my advice, that there are so many masters, which master should we follow? And I say, follow any master that pulls you, because he will take you in the right direction. Only keep in mind that the master says, go within. If a master says, go outside to a pilgrimage or something, I won't recommend that, because I don't believe the real truth lies outside anywhere. It all lies inside. If somebody is willing to take you on a pilgrimage within yourself, Except master. Doesn't matter who that master is. He'll take you as far as he can. If your seeking is still there, the perfect living master will find you. It is said, it is said, yep, you must have heard that before. The saying is, many are called, but few are chosen. Have you heard that? Many are called, few are chosen. In that statement, the chosen represents the marked souls. The many are called means the many who happened to meet a master or who the master is able to see in his lifetime as a physical being who come in contact with him but are not marked souls. The marked souls are guaranteed to be picked up by that master. They have been given that assurance before they even were born into any physical or other forms. Even as spirits, as souls, they got the assurance. And they are the ones. It, the story is told in the book called Anurag Sagar, which means the ocean of love. The story is told of creation in the form of an allegory, in the form of parables and stories, that the souls which were all blissfully dancing around around the creator, and they were part of the creator in their true home. And then they said, okay, one of the sons, out of the 16 sons, uh, major heirs of the creator sitting there, decided to have his own kingdom set up. Many souls said, we'd like to go and have an adventure in this new kingdom that he's setting up. The fifth son, called Passion, is setting up some kingdom. We want to go there. And they said, yes, a lot of souls, millions of souls just rushed to go there. And some said, what if we get trapped there? So they turned back to the creator and say, Father, we are your children. We are going out on an adventure. What if we get lost? And the father said, if you get lost, don't worry. I'll come myself and bring you back. 
and the description there is those are the marked souls. And they were given an assurance right to the beginning of creation of this universe. So when these, in this universe, when a perfect living master comes in, comes in the form of a human being like ourselves, and therefore his role is limited. His message is for all humanity. The truth he speaks about is for everybody in the world. But his task as a, as a master is to definitely pick up those marked souls. And when he picks up those marked souls, he initiates them and takes them back home. And they do not come back into the cycle of rebirth again. It does not mean that they, and that they go away immediately. Many of them are also picked up and initiated, but they are not the marked souls of that master. They still find another master, maybe another perfect living master, maybe not in this life, in the next life, maybe in the third life, depending upon the preparation they have made on the spiritual path. But once the final master picks them up, after which they never reborn, that was the marked soul. Now that is a good story. You know, all this truth has to be told in the form of stories because there are no really words to describe situations in beyond time and space. So we make these stories. But the uh, truth of the matter is, and I read that, which makes sense, he does not call the qualified. He qualifies the ones he called. He does not pick up marked souls. He picks up souls that get marked. And that they get marked from ab initio, from the day of creation, and not from that day. When a perfect living master intervenes in our life, in anything, he does not intervene from that point. His intervention is to change the destiny from beginning, completely beginning. And therefore the whole thing is as if it was always like that. It's a beautiful, beautiful way things happen. We were talking of free will earlier, and I gave you an example of my own experience where somebody could tell me exactly what I will be thinking in the next five minutes. So I discovered that I really don't have free will. But if everything is written in advance, can a master come and change it? A good question. If a master has the power and he's the real creator in human form, he should be able to change the script of any of the destinies any time. Does he change it? Well, there is a script written at the physical plane. We live a life in which we have plans for the physical world, in which we think we have free will. What is recorded as predetermined is not recorded here. It is recorded in the astral stage. Only when you go in meditation to the astral stage, you can see that what you thought you are deciding has already been decided. And you are just going through the motions of it. If a master intervenes, he changes that astral script. When he changes the astral script, the physical things change as, as if from the beginning. But you go to the causal level, it also records that the master will change it. If that's pre-recorded. <laughs> then you say that at the, at the causal level, it's pre-recorded. Then what about the intervention which changes the causal level? Then you go to the spiritual level, there of course the whole thing was made by the same consciousness. And that is not past or present or future. That past, present and future are the same. And at that time, when there is no time, an intervention there is an intervention here at any, at any level. So then you find that the master changes right from that level. And that's a change that the master can say, I always had that change made at a spiritual level. It's a very difficult thing to explain in physical language because we're talking of things beyond time and space. And we have to make stories. Swamiji of Agra, State Shiv Dayal Singh, from whom the Radha Swami movement started, he used to give discourses. And in his discourses, he used to describe, he made stories. He said, in Par Brahm and such Khad, where there's no time and space, the tall trees, several miles high, all laden with rubies and diamonds. You know, his satsangs were attended by women a lot because they heard 
that if we meditate, we'll go into trees that are laden with rubies and diamonds. He was just giving an example. It's an attractive place. I can't describe it. And even the yogis who went only to the second or third stage said, Neti, Neti. We can't describe it. The only description is, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this. There's nothing that we can compare it with. So when we are talking of those experiences, it's very difficult to give even a correct analogy. So we make stories. We all make stories to describe these things. Even these levels of consciousness, which I said to you, were one of the bothersome things that I questioned great master. He said there are no levels of consciousness. There are layers of consciousness, not levels. But our mind likes levels. The mind likes classification. It, um, as a student in college, I won the student's election. I won the president's election. I became the president of the student's union. You know how I did it? Everybody spoke of their great pl plans. I said, I have a 10-point program. I didn't even know what the 10 points were. <laughs> they then began to think of 10 points. And I won. <laughs> the mind loves classification. The mind loves this number game. <laughs> and if you can point out, this is one, two, three, four, five. There's five levels of consciousness, eight levels. Somebody said there's 16 levels. Of course, this can be used to advantage. The great master went to a town called Karachi, now in Pakistan. And uh, that was his first visit. And some of us accompanied him. I was fortunate in going to Karachi. There, my aunt and uncle, my uncle who was my dad's elder brother, he was a meteorologist, a weatherman, working there. And he invited great master to his house, actually. And when he invited the great master, they used to, my uncle and aunt used to go to a swami who was very good in Ayurvedic medicines. They used to go to him for medi medicines, Ayurvedic medicines, but he used to give discourses on the six chakras of various kinds of chakra meditation. So they would listen to his uh, discourses sometimes. Then when the great master accepted their invitation to go to Karachi and stay in their house, they felt very happy. And they went and told the Swami, Swamiji, our master from Punjab is coming here and we would like you to have his darshan. Swamiji said, certainly bring him to me, I'll give my blessings to him. And they were surprised that the Swami wanted to give blessings. We thought the Swami will get the blessings. It was a little bit of a dilemma and a quandrum for them what to do now. So they decided that when the great master is there in their house, that they will invite the Swami also for lunch. So both of them can meet there. So the Lunch was arranged, and great master was staying in their house in the bedroom. The Swami came, and great master, they made the Swami sit on the love seat, which had only two seats. They wanted this great master to sit next to the Swami. So Swami, with his saffron-colored robes, and a saffron turban, and a little uh, muffler kind of thing, also saffron-colored cloth around him, which he used to hold with his hands and walk with, you know, a little pride. I try to walk like that also. It's good. You know, you have something around your neck and walk with that. Beautiful Swami. Bright eyes. And uh, the Swami came and sat down. Then they called Great Master. That Swamiji has come and lunch is ready. Would you like to come out? He said, yes. He came, Master, sit down. So Great Master sat next to the Swami. And uh, my uncle introduced him. He said, uh, Master, this is the Swamiji, Swami Brahmanandji, that we have been talking to you about. And the great Master bowed like this. Swamiji raised his hand and said, I bless you. We watched the scene. <laughs> we said we saw the Swami bless, blessing the great Master. And we were a little taken aback that we didn't expect this to happen. But great Master took it in stride and after a while he says, Swamiji, it's a pity that so many swamis have been lost in the six chakras below the eyes. And none of them are familiar with the 18 chakras. Swamiji said, I didn't understand. What 18 chakras are you talking about? He said, well, six chakras are of the pinda, of the physical body. They arise from the bottom in six chakras, from these centers, and they go, they end at the eye center. 
the six chakras of Anda and Brahmanda lie behind them. And they take you right to the center of the head. The six chakras of Par Brahma and Sachkhanda lie above that. Haven't you heard of these 80 chakras? And Swamiji said, Sir, I must tell you, I never heard of it. Can you explain them a little further to me about these 18 chakras? And he said, you know, we are here for a limited time. You'd have to come to the Dera <laughs> in Vyas so that I can explain to you. And they left after lunch. Swami was so struck by this theory of 18 chakras. He had never heard before. He told his disciples, I am packing up, I am going to Punjab. That man with the white beard has caused big confusion in my mind about 18 chakras and I know only 6 chakras or 7 at the most if I count the uh, head chakra. What are these 18 chakras about? I have to go there. He reached the Dera and he was practicing Ayurvedic medicines. At that time I was practicing some homeopathic medicines. So we used to sit together and compare notes sometimes. The day he arrived the great master was informed Swamiji, Swami Brahmananda has arrived. He said he should be put in the best suite in the guest house. And he will sit next to me in satsang. And he will be allowed to see me 24 hours whenever he wants. Now, these instructions had never been given for any other VIP. Several VIPs would come to Great Master, but never such an honor. So Swamiji came with his buffler and he tested whether it was right that he could go and see the Master any time. Midnight he walked up. I've come to see the Master. Oh, the doors were opened. Master was awakened. Swamiji has arrived. He said, come on, Swamiji, you must welcome. He said, it works. The promise given to me is working. He stayed and enjoyed himself. And then Great Master said, Swamiji, you sit next to me in discourse. So Swamiji sat next to him and Great Master discoursed. All these Swamis lost in the six chakras. How can they know the truth when they're confined to the pinda? They are lost because they don't have any idea. And this Swami was looking at him like this, sitting on the stage. We are watching them. He's looking like that. After a few days, he says, Master, I have a little problem. And Great Master said, What is your problem, Swamiji? He says, When I sit next to you, I have to bend my head all the time to listen to you. I'm having a pain in the neck. Oh, Great Master said, I also noticed that. I think you should sit in front. So he gave him a chair to sit in front. So the chair was right below because that was a high desk from which the Great Master was giving discourses. So he would look up like this. And after a few days, he complained again. He said, Master, I have a little problem. Swamiji, what is your problem now? He says, when I sit in front, I have to raise my head like this. So I have a pain in the neck. And Great Master said, oh, I also noticed that. Move his chair 20 paces behind. So his chair went in the middle of the satsang now. And after a few days, he says, Master, I have a problem. So what is your problem now? I sit on a chair, people behind me are sitting on the floor. It's not right. Great Master said, I also noticed that. Put him on the floor. <laughs> After a couple of weeks, he was sitting with everybody, had to stand in line to go into the house, was no longer staying in that guest house. And he talked to me. He said, this master of yours is a great diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> I have never seen anyone like this. The Swamiji said, had he asked me that I'll have to sit on the ground and do like this, I would have gone away back home. He gave me all the honor. He won my heart. He has zapped me completely. And after zapping me, I fall in love with him. I can't go anywhere. He's a great diplomat. And now he's given me a little hut to practice Ayurveda. And I was next to him doing my homeopathic. And uh, so we used to compare notes. But the Swami was a very, very, very great seeker. And he left everything in order to practice the meditation. So this uh, number about chakras, great master used very effectively, the Swami. <laughs> Though the truth is that uh, how can you count numbers when there's no time and there's no space? But 
we tell stories. We all tell stories. Thank you very much. We'll have a break for lunch. <laughs>